I'm here to talk about the, the Seri, the Kumkak people of Mexico. The Kumkak people of the Sonoran Desert in the northwestern Mexico have always had a close relationship with the Olnea Tesota tree of the region, known more commonly and easily as the Seri people and the Ironwood tree. Both are indigenous to the Sonoran Desert and rarely survive away from it. The Ironwood's distribution crosses the Mexico-United States border into Arizona and California. The Seri rarely leave the coastal region along the Gulf of California. The Sonoran Desert is hot and dry, as deserts tend to be, yet it is home to many species which have been able to adapt to the difficult conditions. The ironwood is a keystone species in this environment. It is one of the largest plants in the region, at up to 15 meters, and one of the longest lived, at up to 1,500 years. Here in the desert, it is large enough to create its own ecosystem, hence the designation as a habitat-modifying keystone species. The ironwood tree is a nurse plant, allowing other plants to take root and grow in its shade, protected both from the hot sun and the occasional frost. It can be up to 15 degrees Fahrenheit cooler in the dense shade of the tree compared to the full sun just a few meters away. The ironwood is a legume and so produces nitrogen to share with other plants, along with the organic detritus. The canopy also protects the soil, helping to conserve precious moisture by shading and slowing down the drying winds. Over 230 plant species have been cataloged growing under the canopies of the ironwood trees. Biologists have cataloged over 300 species of animals living and foraging under the canopies of an ironwood tree. From the bacteria that lives in the nutrient-rich soil under the tree to the hawks and owls that seek out high perches in the top branches, the tree provides homes and food and cover for bees, ants, other insects, birds, mammals, and reptiles, as well as other plants and parasites. While the trees are fixed in place, the Seri people were nomadic. They followed the spare but rich harvest the desert provided over roughly 400 kilometers of coastal Sonora. They followed the seasonal changes and ripening of the fruits of the desert to the north until it was time to turn around, return south, and start over. They built temporary shelters and had regular camps where they stopped but left little evidence of permanent housing or city building, things that the Spanish explorers called marks of civilization. While walking in a desert, it is easy to see the attraction of the shade of an ironwood tree. And with so much diversity there, it is also a natural place to forage for food. The tree provides a high protein seed, which is easily eaten in its green state and still possible to eat after it dries. The seed also becomes source of food for many of the animals that visit the tree, which provides another source of protein for the people. The tree provides a hard, dense wood probably the densest wood in North America. It would become an important source of firewood for the people and an important source for tools. At first use, the branches of the tree probably were used as digging tools or hammers or musical instruments. Later, stone tools were used to work the wood into other useful things such as harpoon points. When McGee went into the area at the behest of the U.S. Smithsonian Institute to study the Papagos and the Ceres, he described the Ceres as the most primitive tribe in North America. He based his claim on his observations concerning lifestyle, dress, shelter, and use of tools. Noting that they had few iron tools, he considered their state to be on the level of a Stone Age tribe. And that was in 1898. He wrote, the Seri are conspicuously unskilled in all mechanical operation involving the use of tools. At that time in Mexico, attempts to Christianize this area had failed. The Catholic priests said that the land was too inhospitable for civilized people to live on and set up a mission far away where they had access to water for farming. Then they tried to move the people to it. The Seri wandered away and returned to hunting and gathering. This led them into more contact and more conflict with the Mexicans, leading to an organized attempt to exterminate them. Within 50 years, the Seri population was reduced from an estimated 10,000 people to fewer than 300 people. 
they survived by their ability to find food and water in a land where others could not see it or accept it. After things calmed down, the Seris were allowed a land base of their own. They were rediscovered by anthropologists and Christians, studied and evangelized, and brought into the dollar economy as fishermen in the late 1930s. They created two settlements, Punta Chueca and El Desemboque de los Seris, which continue to this day. Still, their remote location kept them physically separated from other peoples. A road was not graded and maintained into the village of El Desemboque until in the late 1970s. By then, the tribe had more than doubled in size and adventurous tourists were beginning to discover the unspoiled and uninhabited beaches in the area. This naturally led to some selling and trading, and it led to the awakening of the Seris to what could be sold that they had access to. They had very little to start with, except for fresh fish. One of the first trade items was the baskets that the women made and used. They sold the baskets and bought or traded for cheap plastic utensils to you in their place. Baskets quickly became worth more as trading than their worth in utility. They remain the second largest cash income for the tribe after fishing. During that first rush of tourism, another idea emerged. Various stories have emerged, but the most plausible is that Jose Astorga was carving a toy boat for one of his children, and an anthropologist offered to buy it. And suddenly, wood carvings were valued more as trade items than toys. The kids got something else to play with, and a village industry was born. The carvings were soon in great demand by collectors and museums, both as Indian artifacts and as folk arts. Traders, mostly university students from Tucson, Arizona, started paying for their Mexican vacations or field research work by buying the carvings and reselling them when they returned to the United States. Within a few years, Southwestern curio shops were looking for a more inexpensive source for the popular carvings. Those stores approached the middlemen that were buying other Mexican tourist items from. They, in turn, sourced Mexican wood carvers to produce the carvings faster in greater volume, in greater variety, and much cheaper. When the era of the Mexican copies began, as curio shops across the southwest United States started stocking these small, inexpensive carvings. Demand remained high, but prices tumbled. Most Seri quit carving because they could no longer earn enough to justify the time it took to carve a piece by hand in their style when compared to the price a piece that was turned out on a bench grinder. The Mexicans set up workshop in the nearby cities and turned out these small pieces by the thousands. Serious Mexican carvers also were able to produce work that was highly valued and in a style that Ceres did not produce, which had a wider market appeal, further eroding the market for Seri work. A small number of Seri were able to continue making a living as full-time carvers by selling directly to tourists and the few buyers and collectors who remained loyal to them and preferred their style of work. By the 1990s, ecologists and botanists also became aware that the rate of consumption of the ironwood tree. While Seri carvers were only harvesting dead, dry wood to carve, we saw Mexican workshops where trees had been pulled out by the roots and brought in whole to cut up into small pieces. Also, people who were producing charcoal for grilling were cutting ironwood trees and mixing them with the popular mesquite wood. Others were simply cutting the trees for cooking and heating in their households. At that time, there were only a handful of Surrey ironwood carvers making a living as full-time carvers. There was a movement towards government legislation to give the ironwood tree protected status. This was met with limited success. Laws that were passed were largely unenforceable, and the ironwood population continues to decline. The Seri people are on the forefront of this movement in Mexico to protect the species. They recognize the ironwood tree to be more important in their world than just a source of wood. Traditional products and uses of ironwood include food, medicines, agricultural and household implements, and ceremonial and ritual uses. Because most of the uses utilize either renewable resources, pods, seeds, and flowers, or salvaged wood from already dead trees, their impact on ancient ironwood forests is negligible. Creative marketing strategies have also reignited interest in indigenous arts, including the Surrey ironwood carvings. People who were carvers during the height of the art are now returning to the art. 
Young people are beginning to learn how to carve from the elders. So far, the forms have remained traditional. The Seri carve the animals in their known world. Each carver may have a unique interpretation of the animal, but there is little ex experimentation with foreign animals. It remains a traditional art form. And in the tent next door, Miguel Estrella Romero is a Comcock man who is doing traditional carving in, in his style. I would invite you to visit him, and I'll probably be around that I could answer questions if you have more. Thank you.